Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening. Mr. Tio Xian, Acting Prime Minister, Honorable Ministers, Defence Chiefs, Distinguished Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen. Let me first thank Dr. John Chipman for his kind words of in introduction and for inviting me to speak with you this evening. I'm delighted to be here in Singapore to be joined by so many distinguished government representatives, policy makers, business people, and opinion leaders, and of course, to mark 10 years of fruitful and productive dialogue here at the Shangri-La Hotel. The first time I was here, back in 2002, I was Defence Minister. A lot has changed since then. For one thing, I'm now Prime Minister, which I'm afraid means I get to come between you and your dinner. Ladies and gentlemen, in June 1963, President Kennedy delivering the commencement address at the American University in Washington spoke at length about peace in a thermonuclear age. He said, and I quote, what kind of peace do I mean? What kind of peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I'm talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children, not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women, not merely peace in our time, but peace for all time." End of quote. The thing that strikes me most about his words is that, rather than succumbing to an expedient vision of world peace, he chose not to compromise and to continue to strive for a better world. Three decades later, the end of the Cold War, rather than producing the peace dividends we all expected, has instead given rise to a new set of complex, multidimensional security challenges. The elimination of Osama bin Laden, and now the capture of Ratko Mladic, Mladic Reserve, serve as a reminder of the security threats we face, albeit threats of a different kind to those faced by the world back in the 1960s. Today, we cannot and we must not return to the old bipolarity of that Cold War an era of stalemate and standoff that crippled the world for far too long. And we have no choice but to rise to these new challenges together. In the 21st century, our economies are so integrated and interdependent, and production processes are so dispersed across borders that it make no longer makes sense for global powers to go to war 
they simply have too much to lose. National interest is becoming more and more about collective interest. And our task now is to reflect this in a multilateralism that is both hard-headedly realistic and progressive. Because the way ahead, I have no doubt, must be built on cooperation and not on confrontation. And for that, every region, every country, every leader here today must play their part. The cynics thought that Asia and the West could never truly come together as a cohesive whole, that we had too little in common, that life in Surabaya was simply too far removed from life in San Diego. The last 10 years have proved them wrong. Yes, we come from many cultures and we speak many languages. But as U.S. Defense Secretary Robert Gates, and I wish him well in his retirement, said in this room last year, the Pacific Ocean is not a barrier that divides us, but a bridge that unites us. The United States has long been a modernizing and moderating force within our region, supporting democratic institutions, improving governance, and fostering respect for human rights. Barack Obama has described himself as America's first Pacific president and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has spoken of the need to find strong partners here. Such warm words are welcome, but they are just the latest in a long exchange of ideas and views between the United States and Asia. And I'm pleased that America and, of course, Russia will be taking part in the East Asia Summit for the first time later this year. Next month, we'll see the 40th anniversary of Henry Kissinger's secret mission to China, ahead of President Nixon's historic visit in 1972. Coming in the midst of the Cold War, Nixon's visit shocked many in the United States. How could the fervently anti-communist leader of the Western world possibly sit down with his ideological adversary? The answer, of course, is that the United States saw in China the potential to become a counterweight to the Soviet bloc. But this new alliance went much further than that. Nixon's visit wasn't just about the United States opening itself up to China. It was about China opening itself up to the United States. It is a relationship that has benefited both countries ever since. But such productive dialogue can only take place if there is an openness to engagement on both sides. It would, of course, be quite wrong to suggest that China's actions in the early 1970s were somehow uncharacteristic, that they represented a change in stance and attitude towards the wider world. Since the time of the Ming Dynasty, China has been a great and growing power. And today, as the focus of the world's economy has shifted from west to east, 
from the nations of the Atlantic Ocean to those of the Pacific, China has grown still more assertive, opening up and engaging with its neighbors and competitors. We should see this as a cause for optimism rather than concern. China may be expanding. It has enjoyed spectacular economic growth of 9, 9.5, 10 a year for the last 20 years. But it is not going to dominate the globe in a way the biggest economic forces of the past once did. In the late 1940s, the United States not only had the largest GDP of any nation, it also accounted for more than half of the world's wealth. When, as predicted, China becomes the world's largest economy in around 30 years, it is likely to account for less than a quarter of global GDP. Wealth will be much more evenly spread with the United States, Europe, Japan acting as a balance to Beijing's rapid growth. Nor should China's growing military capacity cause us undue alarm. Despite rapid increases in Chinese military expenditure, the United States will continue to be by far the preeminent military power and by far the biggest spender. And Minister Liang Guangli may oversee the world's largest standing army, but in Malaysia, we know well that China's first commitment is to peace.